Hey, what's up, how you doing? Today we're talking about appendicitis. Appendicitis, common operation, we do it a lot. People hear about it. It's one of those things that people talk about all the time. I had appendicitis at this age. I had appendicitis in my 40s, later appendicitis. So everyone knows what appendicitis is, but they really don't know a lot about it or what the symptoms are. So we're gonna cover that today. Appendicitis is really just inflammation of the appendix. The appendix itself hangs around in the right lower quadrant coming off of the colon. It's right at the junction between the small intestine and the right colon, or the ileum in the right colon, same kind of thing. When you get appendicitis, what happens is, for whatever reason, you get an obstruction of the lymphatics of the appendix that then turns into bacterial overgrowth that then turns into infection. If it's not caught in this bacterial overgrowth infection, you can get what's called perforated appendicitis. Perforated appendicitis, if it's not caught early enough, it then turns into abscess formation. One of the questions we always get is, well, what is the appendix? Why is it there? So from a standpoint of evolution, what we believe is it's similar to a chicken crop. When we ate a lot of vegetables and a little bit of meat, we had to have something to help digest those vegetables. So the appendix was kind of a pouch that little stones would hang out in. Over time, we eat a lot more meat, not a lot of vegetables. So now it becomes dysfunctional. Other than putting my kids through college and keeping my lights on. After that, you want to know, well, why do people get appendicitis? It could be infection. It could be a virus. It could be anything. But the way that you figure out whether or not you have appendicitis is look at your symptoms. The classic symptom is periumbilical pain around your belly button radiating to the right lower quadrant. You then can have fevers, you can have chills, you can have an elevated white count, you can actually have a normal white count. Sometimes if you have nausea and vomiting with periumbilical pain, that is a sign that it may be a virus. So the rest of these kind of start varying depending on the anatomy of your appendix. Constipation is kind of one of those things that people always come in complaining of right lower quadrant abdominal pain, but it's not appendicitis, it's just they're constipated. You can also get flank pain if your appendix is behind the right colon. In females, middle smirts or having pain when you ovulate is very common. So we will see some young ladies that have appendicitis type symptoms, but it's really just in the middle of their cycle, happens once a month. Now you can have chronic appendicitis, we'll talk about that later. For the most part, we're talking about acute appendicitis. One other thing that you can have is diarrhea. Now diarrhea is kind of one of those things that is really more associated with gastroenteritis. A lot of the symptoms that we talked about and some of those signs are associated with gastroenteritis and that's one of the challenging parts of appendicitis. How do you diagnose this? How do you know someone has appendicitis versus just ate some bad chicken wings or had uh, spoiled something? We have to go through symptoms, but we also use diagnostic tools. In order to make the diagnosis of appendicitis, it is usually based on clinical suspicion. What that means is if I think you have appendicitis, then we will proceed like you have appendicitis. That is accurate about 90% of the time. 10% of the time, your appendix is normal when we take it out. That's within the standard of care, and that's okay. If you don't know or have a low clinical suspicion, you will use a CT scan in adults, plus or minus ultrasound in children, to rule it in and rule it out. Ultrasound by itself is not a good test to determine if a child has appendicitis. In adults, usually the abdominal wall is too thick, so it doesn't give us a lot of information. And CT scan or CAT scan is the mainstay of diagnosing appendicitis in adults. In kids, ultrasound is screening, and then use a CT scan to confirm it. You also can do a KUB to look and see if someone's constipated. That helps a lot in kids as well. We do laboratory data, but your CBC can be normal. So you can have a normal white count and still have appendicitis, especially if it's early. The CMP, sodium, potassium, um, your electrolytes, is just to make sure that you are stable for surgery if you have to have surgery. The urinalysis helps us determine whether you have a kidney stone, 
polynephritis, which both can mimic signs of appendicitis if it's on the right. Now, once we make the diagnosis, we then have to start talking about treatments. So there are three main treatments for appendicitis, antibiotics, surgery, and delayed surgery. From an antibiotic standpoint, that has come about really for kids and then adults kind of coming out of our treatment for diverticulitis. In appendicitis, someone walks into the emergency room at 10 o'clock at night. You, by the time you get the diagnosis of appendicitis, it's midnight. Do you want to bring an operating room team in at 2 a.m. where everybody's half sleep, do the surgery, send them home, and then come back the morning and have to operate? That's probably not ideal. So what we've started doing is patients that come in at a later time in the emergency room, we start them on antibiotics. What we first notice is their symptoms don't get any worse, they don't progress, and the disease itself doesn't progress. So if you have appendicitis at 10 o'clock, we start you on antibiotics at 10 o'clock. When 10 a.m. comes around, your appendix is gonna be about in the same stage, so there's nothing lost. But it does make it easier to take care of everybody, and honestly, you're still going home about the same time. Now, what we also learned from that is that if you take that same patient, put them on antibiotics, some patients, if they're caught in that early phase where we talked about having um, early obstruction bacterial overgrowth and haven't progressed to perforation, those patients actually can be treated and almost cured with appendicitis. And it happens about 44% of the time. The people that don't have their pain completely resolved or continue to have mild right lower quadrant pain those people fall into the chronic appendicitis group. And those are the people that we end up having to do a delayed surgery on. As far as surgery goes for appendicitis, the majority of them are now done laparoscopically. So you no longer get that right lower quadrant incision that you had, it's done through a couple of small ports. That in itself has some inherent problems. From a anatomy standpoint, like we said, your appendix occurs right here. Now, when we get ready to do surgery, there are two ways to do it. This is called a McBurney's incision, and you can make it this way, or you can come this way. It doesn't matter, but usually in the right lower quadrant. When someone does that, it's an open approach. If you're doing it laparoscopically, your trocars can go anywhere. For me, I typically do a trocar here, here, and one around the belly button. And that allows me to triangulate and get the appendix out this way and we pull it out through the belly button so your larger incision is here and you can hide it and just use two five millimeter trocars. That works the majority of the time. If you have someone that is larger or the appendix is uh, very inflamed, you may have to put a trocar up higher so you can spread out and have a little room. In kids, sometimes what we'll find ourselves doing is changing this port orientation to a different approach just because of their size. So sometimes we'll put one trocar here, one up here, and this one here, and this is the larger port. The camera goes down here, and we work from this direction. That's just traditionally done because of the size of the patient. Once you go in, you basically fire a stapler across the appendix, take it out, and that's it. Every once in a while, if someone has a really bad appendix and it's significantly inflamed, what we'll do is right here where the small intestine comes in, that's the ileocecal valve, what we'll do is actually come in with a stapler and take off this entire area. And that's called a partial cecectomy. That's so that we get healthy tissue in this area and it allows it to heal. But once that's done, we close it up. You can close it up with sutures, close it up with staples. You can even close it up with uh, Dermabond or Superglue. I traditionally do Superglue. After that, we take it to the recovery room and then that's where it changes. If you have a bad appendicitis and let's say you have a drain because you had a bad abscess or if it was perforated, you may have to stay overnight. If it's an early uncomplicated appendicitis, you can have it done as an outpatient or pretty much same day surgery. If you develop an abscess from a perforation, you will go home around day five to seven. You may end up having to have a drain placed in radiology. 
if you have uncomplicated appendicitis, you can go home as early as four hours. About 90% of the time, our appendicitis are done as outpatients because 90% of the time we catch them before they're perforated. If you average the patients that have perforated appendicitis versus the regular patients, the average length of stay is about a day and a half. And that's just because there's that subset of patients that for whatever reason they develop an abscess and they have to stay in the hospital overnight. As far as postoperatively, what are you looking for? You also look at resolution of symptoms. What your resolution of symptoms means is that you're no longer having right lower quadrant abdominal pain. If you're still having right lower quadrant abdominal pain after your appendix, you gotta start thinking about some of this other stuff that's occurring or some type of complication or an injury. One of the things that we always look for in the operating room, if we get in there and the appendix looks normal but they still have a classic story, is we look for a Meckel's diverticulum. That's a whole nother lecture, but pretty much two feet away from the ileocecal valve. Um, it can have two types of mucosa. There's a whole algorithm that goes with that. The other thing is diverticulitis in adults. Sigmoid diverticulitis can present like appendicitis, except they have epigastric and midline abdominal pain. Kidney stones or nephrolithiasis, that can also, if the stone is caught in the ureter um, on the right, it can cause similar symptoms and similar discomfort and your CT scan can actually show a little bit of inflammation. So we usually do a non-contrast CT first to rule out kidney stones and then give them contrast as well as the urinalysis to make sure that that's not the case. Bad kidney infections can also cause it. Now, after your appendix is out and everything's good, we send it to pathology. The pathologist looks at it to make sure there's not an adenocarcinoma, which is a traditional cancer of the right colon, because again, this is off of the right colon or a carcinoid tumor, which is not the same as a traditional adenocarcinoma of the colon, but it has its own inherent problems. You see this a lot of times in the tip of the appendix. Depending on how deep it is into the appendix, depending on how close it is to the colon, that determines if anything else needs to be done. For the most part, most appendiceal carcinoids are completely treated with just an appendectomy, and all you need to do is have a follow-up CT scan in the next couple of months to make sure that you haven't had any tumor spread anywhere else. There are a host of other tumors that you see traditionally in older patients. You can see um, mucinous cystadenomas, mucinous cystadenoma carcinomas um, of the appendix. Any patient that is over the age of about 40 that develops appendicitis, you also need to make sure that this is not a colon cancer or an early presentation from that. So all old people, anybody over the age of 45, including me, if you have appendicitis, you need to get a CAT scan done at some point. I recommend about six months after your appendicitis to make sure that we're not missing anything. You're not looking for very large cancers because a large cancer would be picked up on a CT scan. You're looking for small tumors that normally would be missed on CAT scan that are found in the cecum, which is the right part of the colon. Hopefully this pretty much covers appendicitis. I, like I said, this is one of those topics that you could go on and on in, but this gives you a pretty good overview. If you have any questions, hit me up on Instagram, DM me, put it in the comments, and we'll try to get them answered. Hope this all makes sense. Thank you, take care.